Hello everyone, welcome to the latest lecture session. Let us uh, get this started by looking at what we discussed in the previous session. In the previous session, I was trying to uh, you know take us through why it is that this course is relevant to uh, humanity at large and then in general Indians I guess, right. So the relevance was that you know we are going to look at uh, how to save lives or prevent uh, unnecessary deaths and in that context we looked at how you know people first did not know that uh, pathogens existed and that we can act as carriers of diseases or let us say the doctors could act as carriers of diseases and that the disease does not transmit from or through air or can let us say transmit through air but one of the major uh, routes of transmission is by contaminated water let us say right and this contaminated water will look clear but you know uh, we do know now that uh, we can uh, look at or visualize these microbes only under a microscope let us say right. So that is something that uh, we looked at and we started looking at uh, some data right where we have numbers of typhoid cases per 1 lakh population this is Philadelphia 1890 to 1935. We saw with increasing urbanization uh, increasing numbers of uh, what do we say uh, cases of typhoid and then based on trial and error people figured out that filters or sand filtration could lead to or you know uh, leads to lesser number of uh, cases. So they started using filters and you see that Philadelphia grade drop and then uh, again by trial and error or such people understood that chlorination was leading to what we say lesser number of uh, what we say typhoid cases and thus number of deaths. So again after chlorination so much further decrease let us say exponential decrease that is something that you can see out here and that is what we uh, see out here right. So what do you expect now lesser number of again typhoid is one particular uh, what do we say waterborne or uh, water communicated uh, disease I guess right. So most of these diseases cholera, typhoid and those that typically end up in diarrhea let right? us say what happens now typically you have these particular uh, pathogens and let us say if I have it and my feces contaminates the drinking water of that locality obviously you know all the people in that area are going to be affected by the disease that I had let us say. And in the particular case in uh, London you know a particular child's diaper was washed and into that cesspit or the septic tank and that particular water was contaminating that area let us say and that is how it uh, goes on and or is transmitted let us say right. So again people first were not uh, willing to take that at face value because the thought of you know drinking water that is being contaminated by human feces was too harsh for people let us say again that is something that we see even now but we will uh, look at that again uh, later let us say. So here uh, with this advancement let us say this advancement meaning sand filtration and disinfection by chlorination let us say right Cl2 or HOCl. You know, so we say that it is supposed to lead to lesser number of uh, water or those diseases that are borne by water and thus uh, number of cases and thus the mortality should decrease. Let us look at what we have here. Here we have life expectancy this is in the USA. So it is at birth meaning at birth let us say uh, uh, the infant how many years can he or she be expected to uh, live let us say. So this is in blue. And then we have another uh, metric. So at 60 years, how long is it supposed to, is he or she, uh, you know, typically going to live? But here I try to, uh, what do we say, tweak the data so that I can compare it. For example, at birth in the year 1900, uh, you know, 50 was the uh, average life expectancy at birth, let us say. But at 60 years, so 60 minus uh, 74, it was supposed to be 14. But for comparison, I in increased it by 60 years. So at 60 years, the life expectancy was 14 years, right? So or the person would have uh, would be expected to live to 74 or 75 years, let's say. So why is this uh, uh, gap here? It means that obviously there are a lot of people uh, dying, or not people, let's say infants or children dying 
uh, during their uh, what we say nascent stages of life. Why is that again? Typically due to these particular diseases or such that we are experiencing in India right now. So that is why we see this considerable difference let us say in uh, what do we say uh, the year 1900 but again the difference was almost 25. By 1950 let us say the difference came down considerably as in life expectancy at uh, 60 years also increased but only slightly because medical advancements at that time were not very great with respect to the elderly population. But with the advent of disinfection and uh, sand filtration and different levels of uh, sanitation we see that the life expectancy at birth jumped from 50 to almost 70. So, that is an increase of 20 years in life expectancy, but still there were some uh, what do we say uh, there was still some difference between the life expectancy at birth 70 and life expectancy at 60 years. So, at a person at 60 can be reasonably expected to live for 17 more years or reach the age of 77, but as you see advancements were decreasing the particular uh, what do we say difference here right and then by 2000 or early 2000 we see that uh, there is considerable or relatively some increase in the expectancy at 60 years, but now the expectancy at birth which is 80 is almost the same as the expectancy at uh, 60 years let us say right. So, what does that tell you that you know over time especially within the first uh, uh, half century of the 20th century meaning 1900 to 1950 they were able to you know bring down the uh, death rate among uh, children let us say let us say why or how what was the major reason it was due to uh, sanitation and uh, what is it disinfected water right that is the primary uh, reason that drove this particular uh, life expectancy. Again life expectancy let us say again leads to you know relatively more uh, thriving economy too right otherwise the uh, you have a sick populace typically the economy does not uh, do as well. So, let us look at it you know by comparing the data from India too. So, here we have or I have the data from both USA and India and I tried to see to it that USA blue colored uh, India green colored uh, data sets and then at birth uh, the square shaped region right at birth and uh, circle is the one at 60 years. So, as you see in India in 1900 let us say our life expectancy at birth was abysmally low 24 while in the US which was already a relatively developed country by that time it was uh, uh, what is it now 50 now. So, all the people who uh, keep talking about uh, all the good that the British have uh, done in spite of uh, the facts or data this is one more set of data out here. Again let me not go into uh, other uh, details here. So, again life expectancy was remarkably low and by the year uh, 1950 it increased slightly, but not uh, uh, drastically you can see the difference in slope here I guess right. You can see that uh, difference here right for example, here it is 20 points or 20 years and here it is uh, what is it from an abysmally low value it is still uh, to a low value 12 years increase I guess and I did not find or could not find the data for life expectancy in India at 60 years for the years 1900 and 1950. But since then after independence we had a considerable what do we say increase uh, in life expectancy at birth that is because I guess you know people now think about themselves and we had uh, relatively good uh, what we say administrations over the year you know considering different aspects let us say that we were at war and we were facing food shortages and so on and so forth. We see that you know it is almost uh, how much is it now 30 uh, increase I guess or 27 years increase within this uh, 50 year period now right. So, that is a remarkable increase and we see that in 2000 though we still have a considerable gap between the life expectancy at birth in India at 26 and at 60 years which is 76 let us say right. So, we still have uh, what is it I guess 13 year uh, difference. So, we still need to uh, catch up, but we are on the uh, right track, but the aspect that we need to note is that you know diarrheal disease or such they can be eliminated relatively easily, but lack of awareness and obviously sources of energy. Why sources of energy? Why do I say so? Because let us say if you boil the water let us say for the right amount of time I think one and a half minute at uh, the boiling temperature around 100 degrees centigrade you are going to kill most of these pathogens, but you need energy to boil them and people need time let us say and the resources obviously right. So, lack of such uh, what do we say good sources of drinking water 
lack of awareness and lack of sanitation as in hygiene let's say you know feces you know at, uh, if we don't wash it properly you know you have the carriers not carriers pardon me the diseases on our particular hands let's say and we act as carriers either we eat or we help in transmission so that's the reason why i guess we always need to wash before we eat or you know hold the utensils and such let's see again something that uh, we see out here as in we were pretty poor at uh, one uh, point in time and also that was the reason why uh, you know our grandmothers great grandmothers or great uh, grandfathers let's say they used to you know try to have uh, what we say large family why is that the life expectancy was very low so earlier you would uh, have heard of you know people uh, giving birth to 10 12 children let's say but only four or three survived let's say but again slowly but surely as the life expectancy uh, the increased you know the number of uh, what we say children that were being produced by a particular couple let's say uh, kept on decreasing and now i guess it's at uh, what we say replacement levels of 2.1 or 2.2 but again because of this increase in life expectancy we see a uh, uh, boom in or we saw a boom in uh, what is it now uh, population or explosive population growth around this particular period but again that's due to the increased uh, what do we say life expectancy obviously everything can't be ascribed to only good water or sanitization and uh, hygiene obviously people were uh, what do we say suffering from famines and such that was cut down upon relatively better food was made accessible and obviously that also leads to what is it uh, higher life expectancy right and uh, now let's move on so here i have some uh, sets of data that i want to share with uh, the people here so we have this uh, water quality report or water quality analysis report from joshimath uttarakhand that's where rurki is uh, you know relatively lower reaches of himalayas where the surface water is relatively pristine the data report was from 2019 here we have the different units typically for for which we are typically concerned at least with respect to drinking water right so uh, what do we have water agreeable but rarely do we really look at that okay ph 8 you know because it's at uh, the mountain reach is that's why it's uh, relatively higher so it's within the acceptable uh, limit turbidity meaning it will give an idea about how many suspended particles there are for example if i take some mud and put it in a glass uh, what do we say water i mean bottle i mean uh, water uh, that's held in glass let's say and i'm going to put some mud in it i see you know with turbidity or the suspended matter let's say right some of it will settle down some of it will be suspended and i can measure that by turbidity let's say that gives you an idea about the suspended matter and total solids let's say total solids meaning is equal to total suspended solids which we just uh, discussed about and also total dissolved solids total dissolved solids as in uh, when i say dissolved solids i guess it's self explanatory let's say if i take water in a glass uh, uh, what is it now uh, in glass glass let's say right and i put in either salt or if not a remarkable amount let's say spoonful of salt and stir it the salt is not going to settle down it is going to dissolve same case with sugar or some such uh, compounds they dissolve let's say right obviously at a certain threshold that's with respect to the solubility product so tds let's say total solids and total dissolved solids let's say obviously there will be some errors that's why you see some variation so chlorides we are concerned hardness in the units of calcium carbonate sulfate nitrate and alkalinity this is what we are typically concerned with and typically as you see almost all of the parameters are uh, relatively low are uh, pretty good again hardness i guess with respect to deposits or the water would have uh, what we say come across or come in contact with calcium uh, or lime deposits that's why uh, seems like hardness is almost at the limit but other than that you see that it's pretty good right so right so that's something that you have and here we have the indian standards for drinking water that's something we will look at later bis 10000 or 10500 and again one aspect i would like to point out is that acceptable limit is out here and permissible limit in the absence of alternate source is also mentioned and one aspect i would like to point out is that total dissolved solids we allow it to be as high as 500 that should not create issues too high and you are going to have digestive tract related issues and such and too low which is what most people are drinking now because most of the relatively affluent families are using reverse osmosis based uh, water treatment units 
and obviously there the TDS is going to be very low 10 or so and if you are not having uh, recycle or such or bypass pardon me you are uh, drinking uh, water that is very low in the what we say dissolved salts or dissolved solids which are actually beneficial to health. You need chloride, sulphates and so on and so forth at some levels in our body but we are uh, you know depriving of our body uh, by I guess spending money. And then uh, Joshimat is somewhere out here let us say further downstream I guess we have Rishikesh but still relatively pristine. Let us say we are now looking at Ganga surface water body the data is from November 2018. So, what do we see again pH relatively less turbidity is slightly higher compared to Joshmat. Total solids again uh, I guess in the same range total solids and dissolved solids others two are in the same uh, what do we say range more or less right. But one aspect that pops up here is that we see that uh, the uh, what is this now total coliform which is a, which gives us an idea about contamination by fecal matter human feces let us say right is uh, not 0. But what is the requirement with respect to drinking water it has to be 0 but it is 26. Uh, why is that you know and what does that indicate? Why I guess is that you have uh, you could have what do we say sewage from rich cage flowing into Ganga. Also you know you have people uh, taking a bath in uh, Ganga right because it is considered uh, pure and that it is going to wash away the sins right. So, people take a holy dip in uh, Ganga in uh, Rishikesh. So, that could be the reason how we have contamination of the relevant water there with uh, fecal matter. But obviously, this is one way you know or uh, where transmission of the relevant pathogen takes place right. So, this water is not fit for drinking but all the other parameters are fine but this water is not fit for drinking because of the pathogen count right. So, the coliform count will be exponentially high obviously during religious festivals when people bathe in the river. For example, we have different kumbh melas and such and once a year we have uh, different religious uh, processions out here where people come take a dip in Ganga take the water and go back home and during that time I am sure you know uh, you are going to have remarkably higher coliform uh, levels there. And I wanted to compare that to groundwater from a village near Roorkee ok and again the data is from a month ago let us say October or I think September 2020 let us say. Why are we looking at this data because typically in India let us say a lot of people use uh, ground water and they think that it is pretty you know clean let us say. Why obviously because it looks clear smells fine let us say. Let us look at uh, this out here. So, parameters total solids, total dissolved solids, total dissolved solids high but not very high. Hardness is high yes that was an issue that was leading to considerable digestive uh, tract related issues and some joint related pains to the uh, local population of that village. And alkalinity is high but typically that is not of great issue. Sulphate and sodium is also relatively uh, what do we say low right. And then with respect to coliform though keep in mind this is ground water and I think they were uh, pumping the water up from 120 feet let us say. And another one we are going to look at is from 200 feet right. The coliform value is 1600 most probable number this is called most probable number 1600 per 100 ml sample. And what is the standard for drinking water it is supposed to be 0. And how is this occurring now before we go further discussing the relevant uh, reason let me also look at the second sample which was collected from 200 feet. So, pH TS TDS fine TDS uh, slightly high but hardness is still high as you can see others are ok. Alkinity of is not of great issue in general, but again we see that coliform contamination at uh, relatively shallow depths greater contamination as high as 1600 and at relatively greater depths we see relatively less contamination 40. Again most probable number MPN stands for most probable number per 100 ml sample let us say. Again uh, how is this being contaminated this many ground water being contaminated with uh, human feces or such let us say how obviously because we are going to have at least in the villages and most of the even the urban areas you are going to have septic tanks that are nothing but crude pits let us say right septic tank supposed to have some certain design we maybe we might look at it during this uh, the, during the course of this class. But again in these villages or in most of our areas people with uh, you know half knowledge which is pretty dangerous are going to build these septic tanks and they have no what do we say impermeous layer or such at the bottom or maybe even the sides. So, you have all the sewage being from the homes accumulating there 
and that is going to leach into the ground loop, right. For example, you have septic tanks out here and I would have loved to have nitrate and NO3, I should have collected that, but I did not do that, maybe next time. I have all the sewage out here. So, because there is no such, uh, what do we say, impermeable layer, this uh, contaminated or the sewage is going to go out here and if the groundwater table is out here as in, if the porous layer is out here, that is where you will have the groundwater and the sewage is going to go down and contaminate this groundwater and people are and if the groundwater is in this uh, flowing in this direction, now you have human feces contaminated groundwater being pumped up and then being consumed by the relevant local uh, population. So, in this context, I want to uh, discuss one aspect that the relevant project assistant raised. He mentioned that he saw a particular documentary where, I mean, he was the person who collected the sample and got it analyzed in our labs. And when he was looking at the data, you know, he was uh, wondering about why this is an issue. The reason why he was, uh, what do we say, confused was that he saw a particular documentary and where a person really, uh, living near Varanasi or such uh, was fine when drinking the water from the river or from the vicinity of that particular river, Ganga. Uh, but a foreigner who came and drank that water immediately fell ill and our project assistant thinks that, you know, we are, uh, if not a better race, we are, I guess, a healthier race and thinks that, you know, why are we, you know, concerned about this uh, coliforms or such. But as we just looked at the data, let us say, shows us that, you know, there are a lot of deaths uh, with respect to uh, the age group 0 to 5 and 5 to 14 due to diarrheal diseases, let us say. And again, diarrheal diseases typically due to contamination of water by uh, human feces. So, let us say if I survive, let us say, or if my child or your child or your friend survive during that period and then make it to the next stage, maybe they will not be affected by that particular, uh, what do we say, pathogen or such, but typically you will keep having episodes from time to time, let us say. But here it is not, a, we cannot make such uh, uh, simplistic, uh, what do we say, comparisons based on one particular observation, because we know from the data that a lot of the susceptible population is still dying, let us say, susceptible meaning the ones that are still uh, yet to develop their own immune systems or such, let us say, right. I guess that is a layman's term. So, we have children dying out there and uh, lacks uh, every year. And again, why is that? Because of diarrheal disease. It is not as if Indians by themselves are, you know, uh, remarkably better off race or such. We are experiencing what we say different, uh, what we say, issues or health issues every time. So, that is what we have out here and the western population, they are not experiencing it or used to these pathogens anymore. So, when they come in contact with these pathogens, yes, they might be re relatively more susceptible. But please note that the chances of them coming in contact with these pathogens are almost nil because of sanitation and uh, clean uh, and disinfected drinking water, right. So, that is something to uh, keep in mind. And uh, let us move on out here, Yamuna though. You know, why Yamuna? I guess it comes through the national capital region, Delhi. You know, you, it starts at around Dakpathar, then flows through Haryana and then Delhi. And Delhi again, what is it, 1 crore or 1.5 crore population NCR region. And let us look at what we have. You know, we have samples collected in October, November and December, let us say. And uh, this is the uh, winter period out here, at least from November winter period. Fecal coliform, which gives us an idea about the contamination or level of contamination of the water sample by uh, human feces, let us say, right. Fecal coliform, this uh, live in the guts or the intestines of warm bodied animals. So, we have a Nizamuddin bridge uh, where, uh, you know, typically we have it is a lot of pollutants accumulating out there and both upstream and uh, downstream or maybe my uh, assistant, uh, what do we say, messed up the data. Uh, anyway, we see that the coliform count is remarkably high, right? And that tells you about the level of either partially treated or untreated sewage coming into uh, Yamuna. Why is this an issue? Obviously, again, you have contamination of the groundwater, you have people uh, depend upon it for either daily activities, if not drinking water, or if not for a source of drinking water and such. So, you as a water or wastewater treatment expert will now be able to better explain or when you at least, you know, take up your job as any other, you know, either civil engineer or any other job, you will at least be aware 
and be able to take part in what we say hopefully arriving at the right decision let's see so that's the reason for offering this course and with that i will end uh, today's uh, session and in the next session we will look at the outline and see what it is that we are going to discuss but in general uh, as i mentioned we are going to look at wastewater treatment and water treatment again uh, i thank you for your patience